Hello, everybody. I'm coming in for the first of this little short video series I've decided to do. And this is largely in response to the nationwide protests that are still continuing right now over the death of George Floyd, who unfortunately was an African-American man who was a victim of police brutality in a sort of a sort of way and unfortunately died shortly after being taken into custody and it, it's a mess right now really but I, I want to make this video in this small little series in response to this because this is in support of those who are def not do not who are trying to protest I am not the type that's gonna go out there and protest right now I'm not because I'm not the type that can go out there hold a picket fence. I'm not the type that's really going to go out there and march down a street. I'm not that type of person. I, I do congratulate and I support those who do have the courage and the enthusiasm to go and do this. Congrats to you and thank you for using your First Amendment rights. I know that I, I am going to say this right now. Before I go further, we will be listing some of my personal opinions in this. I understand not everyone may share my opinions, but this country is supposed to be able to listen to an opinion and be able to adhere to it. And my opinions, they shouldn't be offensive to you unless you are a white supremacist. If you are a racist in any form or you are a white supremacist, do not watch this video. Don't even watch my channel. I have no respect for racism, just like this country should have no respect for it. So I want to make that clear. I have no respect for that stuff, and I have no respect for anyone that stands by and just does absolutely nothing, be it in government, be it in little town, be it at work, be it wherever. If you see wrong, don't stand by and do nothing. Do something. I'm not saying go out there and protest, but do something to support the movements. And here I'm going to criticize our president a minute here. He has sat there and done almost nothing through this crisis except antagonize it further. I know he's a divisive issue. I know that. But I have to say that. A real leader in a crisis doesn't sit there and... I am sorry to say this, but the other night I, I got news here that... There was an incident in front of the White House where violent protesters were tear gassed, which I understand, yes, they need to, when they're getting violent, maybe you do need to tear gas them, because they're getting violent, they're threatening to break down. That shouldn't happen. The Constitution does not protect violent protests. The Constitution's First Amendment in the Bill of Rights states that you have the right to peacefully assemble for a redress of grievances. Note the word peacefully. Not violent, not graffiti, not lighting cars on fire, not charging and throwing rocks and stones, well, rocks and stones are the same thing, or glass or whatever, not that kind of thing. But then it took me until yesterday that I learned on the news that the whole reason they've been tear gassed wasn't just because they were violent. It was so the president could make a photo shoot op. He could go to across the street to a Episcopal church and take a photo op, which had been planned, which... Okay, the president's going to a church. Okay, that's not common. But still, I don't approve of the tear gas. But what really ticks me off is to hear from the bishop of this church that the president, he never once came to pray, never really once opened a Bible, but yet in one photo he's holding the Bible. Mr. President, if you by chance ever watch this, or one of your advisors, or any of your supporters, I ask you one question. I see you can hold a Bible. Can you read it? Have you read it? And will you? As a citizen of this country, I simply ask that you maybe once open that Bible that you had in your hand. As I understand that the move was likely to support your ev evangelical ch ch Christian Republican base for the upcoming 2020 election, which is understandable. But we are in the middle of a national crisis. And I expect that the President of the United States, especially on his own country, should at least show some kind of support for those who are standing up against injustice. I'm not saying I stand with Democrats, 
but I am not saying I stand with Republicans. I consider myself in the middle. But on this instance, I am disappointed in our president. There have been times, at times, I've actually been impressed by what he's done. There have been times, but there's been times I've been disappointed. And unfortunately, right now, this is one of those times. The leader of the free nation is sitting there taunting violence and everything else, and he hasn't even given us a national address, if I'm not wrong. Why not? Every other president, when a series of crises has happened within our nation, they've done this. Why not? But anyway, the, although this all started with George Floyd dying, and this was a racist, racism is the base of it. Police brutality, yes, is what killed George Floyd, and that is what a lot of protesters are protesting, but the root cause is racism. It's been here since day one. And it's been fought against before, but it's never been truly beaten. And I don't think it ever will be beaten because there's always going to be these people who are just outright lunatics who cannot understand the principle of freedom, the principle of equality. If you can't understand that, get out of the United States now. If you cannot understand freedom, you can't understand equality, and you think that you're better than somebody just because of their color, get out of here. That is not what this country was founded upon, although unfortunately it's not, it somewhat, although we were founded on freedom, it took us a while to really realize this, but that's not what our country is supposed to stand for. I hate to say that, but I have to. Anyway, and just so people know, I have seen the video, of, unfortunately, of the entire incident with George Floyd's death. And in my personal opinion, I'm appalled. It is sick. It is wrong. It is hard to look at. It makes me grimace at some parts. And some parts I can't even really watch it anymore because it just makes me so astonished, so angry, so just concerned, and just so blown out of my mind that a man can cry for help, that he cannot breathe, and the cops sit there, when I even sit there, they're standing there, the one's got his, well, kneeling on his neck, and don't do nothing. Even though you can hear him say that, I cannot breathe, you can hear the people in front of the cop car saying, he can't breathe, get off him. And then he goes limp, and you can see the guy's like, either dead or about dead, because then when they put him on the gurney, his head's flopping around like a rag doll, like he's just some kind of toy. That's not natural. And all while the cops are just standing there to, eh, yeah, I'm just gonna stand here. I'm not gonna do nothing. Oh, you're gonna come at me? I'll take the taser to you. The little Chinese looking guy. I don't know what his name was. I know the one the one that was kneeling, I think his last name was Chauvin or something like that. Anyway, it it really ticks me off that this happened, but regardless of that. This has become an issue in this country, and I'm not the type to go out there and protest. Congratulations and my sincere thanks to those of you who actually will exercise that right. But I'm not the type of person that can go out there in a margin of street and do all that. So I looked at myself and I asked, what could I possibly do to somewhat support those who are standing against this injustice? And I started thinking to myself, and I started realizing there are those in this country who right now are anti against these protesters because they think that, or they claim, well, there's no racism in this country, or it's never been an issue. The African Americans have taken it out of control. What warped up dimension do you live in? That you would ever claim that racism does not exist here, or you would ever claim that they African Americans have taken this out of control. Because I can tell you right now, they have not. African Americans have every right in this country to protest right now because there has been a great injustice done to them, not just now, not just in recent years, but I mean over the centuries in this nation. And this nation as a whole cannot seem to get it through its head that all men are created equal, but yet we can sit here and teach our children this in a constitution and declaration of independence. 
How can we teach our children that we live in a free nation if not every single citizen is going to be treated the same way with equal rights just based on the color of their skin? What makes them different? What, they have a different skin color? Well, guess what? Why don't I paint myself pink and then you can be racist against me? I'd like to just formally address that issue. Nothing on this earth, be it by a government or be it by the God Almighty up in heaven, ever dictates that we should d discriminate against one another just due to a color of our skin or a cultural difference. Nothing. If you think that's right, get out of here or go away. Don't come near me. Don't. Racism is it's messed up. It's wrong. It's evil. It's cruel. It's sinful. And I thought of what I could do to possibly maybe combat this a little bit. And I understand many people aren't properly educated on the history of oppression of racism in this country because a lot of these people have somewhat racist views of their own. They somewhat try to hide the fact, especially, and I will say this with certainty, there are those in the South, it's not all the South, but there are some diehards in the Southern states who still really think that blacks are inferior. They're not. They try to change the Civil War narrative into saying it was a lost cause and it was about states' rights. Oh yes, it was about states' rights. It was about the right to own slaves. And whether or not states could continue to have that institution or not. That is what that was about. So, oh yes, it was about states' rights, all right. It was about slavery. Whether you point it one way or another, it was. I don't care how many times you try to fabricate it. We know what it was really about. Whether you want to sit there in denial about it, that's another. But I thought of what I could do. And I ultimately came up with the factor that I have this YouTube channel. I do history videos. What way could I help other than maybe trying to educate on the history of oppression and racism in this country to help disprove those who would argue that it's never been a problem, it's never really been the big issue here? Yes, it has been. And when I started that, I automatically determined that that is what I'm going to do. So in today's first video, and this is probably the longest <laughs> intro I've ever done. Today's first video will be on the first logical step to really discuss this issue. And that's really the first chapter that African Americans have in this nation and what would become this nation. And that is the issue of slavery. This was the institution that existed here from roughly the colonial days before we were even a united nation. Until 1865, its abolishment with the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. So, without further ado, I would like to start here of the history of slavery here in the United States. And I am not going to make this short by any means, just because it's a topic of other sorts. And the funny thing is, I've actually been debating making a video on this for a while now. But I didn't. I kept trying to push it off because I didn't want to quite do it yet. I didn't want to quite do it yet. And then this came up, and I kindly made the decision that the time is now. you got to make it because it's relevant to what's going on. So without further ado, we shall delve into this topic. I have images. I have the trusty history notebook. And I have another small display here on the fridge here down in my little area that I will also use when the time comes. And the basis of what I'm going to try to do here, I am going to refute every bit of racism that there is. I refute any who think it is right. And I also want to make this clear that if I violate everyone, anyone's opinions, the only opinions I should really violate here are white supremacists. Except for the beginning of this video where I may have chastised the president, there should be no other opinions that should offend you unless you're a white supremacist. Aside from those, I will accept that you're offended by them and you're not a white supremacist. I will accept that. Because I understand that is a touchy subject, even in my family. But anyway, I am going to hit this. I will not be afraid to list some of my personal opinions if I need to. Because I, if I feel it needs to be done to refute those who think that slavery and racism and segregation were all right. I'm not doing my job if I'm not trying to oppose that. I'm not doing my job. The whole basis of history is that we learn from it. And for racists, they don't learn nothing. They don't learn today. 
they don't learn tomorrow, and they will never learn until death. Because they can't even learn history. History has taught us that we need to get together and we need to stop being racist. We need to come together and just realize we're all equal no matter where we're from, who we are, what race we are, what nationality. It don't matter. We are all together and we are all equal. I don't know if you can't accept that, but that's your problem. I can only inform you. I cannot change your mind. And I accept that. But I will do every bit in my power to denounce you if you believe in that stuff. So without further ado, let's get on to this. So slavery exists. Of course, when we think of slavery here in the United States, we think of maybe the Civil War because, of course, that was started. We think of maybe just prior to that as slaves on, down south on the cotton plantations and everything else. But slavery had actually been here far prior to that, and it was here far prior to us declaring independence in 1776. Be, keep in mind, we were former British colonies. Britain is responsible for bringing African Americans here to the Americas, and they didn't bring them just for kicks. They brought them for slave labor. And really, this is where it begins, so we must trace it here. And slavery in the United States can be traced back to about the year 1619 at the earliest. And it was this year that slavery was first introduced to the British North American colonies when a slave privateer ship came to and docked in Jamestown, Virginia, the colonial settlement of Jamestown in Virginia, and docked in 1619. And it dropped off 20 African slaves that had been captured from a Portuguese slave ship. These were the first slaves that are recorded to be here in the what would become the United States. And at the time, slavery was a little bit different in terms of what the slaves were used for. When we think of slavery today, we think of the cotton plantations. Well, back then, cotton was not exactly a cash crop. It was actually a very poor producing crop due to something that we'll discuss later on. Back then, there were three main cash crops in the British colonies, especially in the southern colonies of Virginia, Maryland, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. And these cr cash crops were tobacco, rice, and indigo. Indigo is a plant that is used to make a dye, a color dye. It's like a dark blue, I think, when the color comes. So it's like a dark blue color, if you've ever heard of the color indigo. But tobacco was definitely the big seller. And this was what they would mainly bring in the slaves over for. Now, in the Caribbean, they had sugar. But sugar really doesn't grow well here in the United States, except maybe in Hawaii or, or Puerto Rico. But other than those two... It really doesn't grow well here in the mainland United States, and thus sugar was not the primary crop here on the 13 British colonies. It was tobacco, rice, and indigo. There was not real. There was some cotton, but it wasn't a lot, and we'll explain why later. Now, after this landing in 1619, in which 20 African American slaves were dropped off in Jamestown, the slavery trade rapidly expanded to the North American British colonies, and this expanded greatly, mostly in the 17th century, which is the 1600s. As slaves became, became far more popular, and millions, millions of them were captured and taken as prisoner from Africa, and they were shipped over to the British colonies across the Atlantic. And most of this was due to the fact that prior to slavery really gaining ground here, the main source of labor had been indentured servants, and these were servants that basically, in return for passage, they were mostly poor Europeans from Europe, and what it was, was in order to get passage to the colonies to come over here, they really didn't have enough money to come over here on their own, but they wanted to come over here. They could get, they could sign a contract with a landowner over here in the colonies, and this landowner would pay for that or European to come over here. They would pay for their passage, and they would come over here, but as a term of this contract, in, in return for the landowner paying for the poor European's passage over here, he was required by contract to serve this landowner on his land for a num set number of years. Basically, it was uh, selling yourself into slavery almost. 
there were some rights, but it wasn't very many. And you weren't really free until you completed your years of service with that landowner. But the problem came with the factor this was still pretty high because of the passage costs. So this was still a pretty, although it was a easier source of labor, it was still a pretty high, expensive source of labor. And there wasn't, and gradually over time, there was fewer and fewer indentured servants that were coming to the colonies, and eventually. The African slave trade became a lot more productive for these big slave, not slave owners yet, but landowners as the slaves were a far more cheaper source of labor, mostly not just due to the factor that there was a lot more of them, but because of the factor if you bought a slave, you pretty much owned them for life, and you didn't really have to worry about losing your servants here in a few years and then having to pay another one. You really didn't have to worry about that at all. You would really just get your slave, and it was your servant for life. You didn't have to worry about nothing else, really. So it was definitely a benefit to the landowners for them to do the slavery thing. Not that it was a good thing. By any means, slavery was wrong. I, I am not promoting slavery here. It is a messed up, cruel institution that is honestly, it's a stain that this country ever practiced it. Or didn't abolish it when it was formed. So it really is bad. However, as we go on here, it is estimated that during the 1600s alone, up to roughly the 1750s and the 18th century, roughly anywhere between 6 to 7 million African Americans were enslaved from Africa. Well, these were Africans at the time. They weren't really African Americans yet. But 6 to 7 million Africans were enslaved from Africa and then were imported to the British colonies in the New World from Africa between this between this in this century six to seven million men women children there were slave catchers in Africa they would capture families they would capture men they would capture women they captured children they'd raid villages and then they would take these captives and they would put them on big slave ships and I kid you not this is one of the most horrible aspects of the slave trade as it was called or the middle passage and these slave ships, were packed like sardine cans. And what what do I mean by sardine cans? I mean, if you open up a can of sardines, how close the sardines are packed to each other, that was what the human being slaves were packed to each other. These are human beings. Mind you, these aren't animals. These are human beings or people. And these people were usually half naked or had, weren't even given clothes at all. And usually, it's, bl it's blistering hot. They're out in the middle of the Atlantic, they're given very little food, very little water, some of them are dehydrated, sickness runs rampant on these ships, and I kid you not, they pack them in every space possible, every deck, every shelf. You had slaves literally sitting on top of each other or laying on top of each other. There was no room to really sprawl out at all, and this journey could take weeks to get across the ocean. And also commonly on these slave ships, the overseas on these ships would constantly beat the slaves that were rebellious. They would beat them. They would throw them overboard if they had to. Whip them, whatever they had to do. And you want to see an image of this? I got a painting. We didn't have cameras back then, but I got something. Explain me this. Right here is like kind of a cross-cut view. It's a very famous painting, but this kind of shows the conditions on a slave ship. They're just torturing this guy because he's apparently done something. This one almost looks like let me see here. Looks like he's almost been whipped. Some of them are just aggravated. And then right, right, when I'm talking about sardine cans, I mean, look at the below the deck. They are packed like sardines. Can you imagine like this? I can't. I can't imagine what will convince humans to do this. I don't, I don't even imagine what kind of person in their right mind would think this is right. Yeah, I wanted to show you that. We're going to show you more stuff here as it goes on. I'm, I'm going to organize my picture. That way there's time. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, yes. I know this. Yes. So, basically, a lot of slaves would die just on the journey to the colonies alone due to the horrible conditions they were treated and they were given on the passage here. Now, Slavery would continue to thrive in the colonial America until 
the American Revolution ended in 1783. We started the revolution in 1775. We declared independence the following year in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. And then we actually end the war in 1783, and the United States is now independent fully. It's formally recognized as a new country. This is kind of a problem. And just some revolution facts that might involve African Americans. 5,000 African American soldiers and sailors fought on the American side during the revolution. They were in this too. This is their country too. They fought with us for independence just as much as we did. And uh, the Boston Massacre, there were five people killed at the infamous Boston Massacre in March of 1770. Among those five killed was a former slave called Crispus Attux. So I also want to state that here. One of the earliest victims of American independence was a former slave, was a African-American. They have suffered the same stuff we have. Don't tell us that they – don't be one of those supremacists and say, well, this was founded for white people and white people fought the wars. There were black people in this too, and they suffered just as much as we did, if not worse. They suffered worse probably because not only did they deal with the same stuff we did, they had to deal with slavery. They had to do with racism because of – like them. I don't want to use any foul language here, but I, I'm not going to try, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Lord, give me strength. Anyway, the institution would continue without question until 1783. And something I really want to point out here as critical is the factor that when we had the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote in this Declaration of Independence that all men had a right to several – they had several inalienable rights, rights that could never be taken away from them. And among these was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But another thing that he would state is that all men are created equal. A new country has been formed. But slavery still exists in this country, so many people back then and even today, we kind of question, well, if we said that all men were created equal and they all had a right to freedom, then why did we ha persist with slavery? I'll tell you why. It was racism and ignorance. That's what it was. Now, many would see this institution of slavery continue. There was also starting to be conflict over whether or not slavery should continue because of this. And there were some saying that slavery should continue, should continue to exist because it was good for the economy. Others were starting to say, well, it can't exist because we're supposed to be a free nation. Now, why does it make any sense to have a slavery? Which it don't. Now, this was – the main anti-slavery movements really started to begin in the northern states like New York, Pennsylvania De – uh, not Delaware because Delaware actually had still slavery. Uh, let me think. New Jersey, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont uh, – yeah, Vermont, Connecticut, Rhode Island. This is where a lot of the anti-slavery stuff really begins. It's mainly getting up in the north because the north was not as heavily dependent on slavery as the more agricultural south, south, southern states were. So there's really a starting of calls for abolition of slavery. This is the first calls that we get for abolition. Of course, this does not happen. But a lot of people up north, these abolitionists, start connecting the oppression that they had suffered under the British to the same oppression in a way that the African Americans are feeling under slavery, which they're not entirely wrong except for the fact that it's much worse than what the British were doing to us, really. Now, a further inhinderment to the freedom of African Americans was done when the Constitution itself was written. We think of the Constitution as a good thing, but in the terms for African Americans, it was actually almost a piece as you don't matter. And this is another thing that's going to blow me up because of what they did. When the Constitution is written in 1787, slaves are never actually explicitly stated in the Constitution. The Constitution, in its words, never explicitly says slaves or slavery. However, it did come to an issue when it came to the terms of determining representation in the House of Representatives. As we may know, the 
number of representatives a state has in the House is determined by its population of people, the number of people living within a state. Well, this is what kills me. Southern states, when they were writing the Constitution, Virginia at the time, which it were which at the time were Virginia, Maryland, the Carolinas, and Georgia, they wanted they argued that the slaves should count as a whole person. But yet, any other time, oh, they're property. They're property. They're not people. But yet, when it comes to your political advantage, oh, yes, they're a person. That blows me out of my mind, and it makes me, it makes me ticked. Oh, oh, they're, they're a person because we'll get more representation. Why? So you can be more racist toward them? So you can continue your vile institution? So you can continue to spread the misuse down to your descendants that, oh, they're inferior. Guess what? Get just If you were going to do that from the beginning, why did we form a country? Why? And then to make it worse here, I want to point out the Constitution actually made a compromise with the South. In order to get the southern states to really join, they agreed that the slaves would count as only three-fifths of a person. They wouldn't count as nothing. Which, according to the southern states, well, since they're property, well, why should they count for anything? You consider them property. But no, they count as three-fifths of a person. They're a person. But what ticks me off is that they were only willing to recognize them as a person because it was to their political advantage. If they had more representation in the House of Representatives, the southern states could pass more laws that were in their favor. Such as defending the institution of slavery. So it's really an insult that this, they even allowed this. Of course, this compromise is, of course, annulled. It's no longer effective in the Constitution, but it still makes me ticked off. Ugh. And then, basically, the Constitution did that, but it also did, it guaranteed slavery by basically saying this. It did not list slavery, but the Constitution did say that it guaranteed a right to repossess any person held to service or labor. Basically, slaves. It defended it. And to make, I want to stay here, that some of our founding fathers were slave owners. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Morris, uh, Patrick Henry, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, all of them were slave owners. Now, some of them did arrange for their slaves to be freed after their deaths, like George Washington. Others, I think Benjamin Franklin did as well, but like others, like Thomas Jefferson, he was so in debt when he died that his slaves mostly had to be auctioned off to his own family, except for several that he chose to free in his will due to the fact that he had fathered them with a slave. Oh yes, Thomas Jefferson was having an affair with a slave woman. Oh yes. So, basically, slavery is defended in the Constitution, but yet we're supposed to be a country for the free. We're not a country of the free. Get that out of your Constitution. You, you can't even claim that. It's an insult that you even try. Well, at the same time, in the late 1700s, as the Constitution is being formed and the United States is really beginning to come about, there is a sense in the South, that slavery may actually be coming to an end. And the, you might ask me right now, well, what do you mean it'd be coming to an end? Well, here's the problem. Remember earlier that we state that cotton was not the king profit crop in the South. It was tobacco mainly, with rice and indigo being as secondaries. Well, by the late 1700s, mind, mind you, they've been planting tobacco, rice, and indigo repeatedly in the same farmland in the South for over 100 years now. And they've exhausted the soil by the late 1700s. The soil is no longer being as productive as it was 100-some years ago because they've constantly used it without really giving it time to recover. And thus, the tobacco coming up isn't as profitable. The rice isn't coming up real good. The indigo isn't coming up real good. None of the main cash crops are coming up real good. And this starts an economic crisis in the South and also calls into question slavery because they start wondering, well, if we can't really grow the tobacco, rice, and indigo, do we really need the slaves? And slavery, I think, had this – cotton was – although cotton was in the South, here's the problem. We're going to realize what the problem with cotton was. 
cotton was not a cash crop, but it could be grown in the South. And the reason it wasn't really a cash crop was the fibers, of course, of cotton are what we use in clothing and cloths and stuff like that and textiles. Well, these cotton fibers, if you've ever seen a cotton plant, it's a lot of work trying to get these fibers separated from the hundreds and hundreds of seeds that are in the pods that cotton is. You've got to, and of course, there's no machines really back then, so they have to take the cotton fibers out by hand and get the seeds out by hand. Kind of like, um, this isn't a direct, exactly like it, but if you've ever maybe husked corn, like a corn on the cob, if you've ever taken like the little silk, I think is what it's called, that we, the little string things, and you've ever like kind of, you're getting ready to boil corn, and you're taking the husk off, you're taking the leaves off, and then you see all that silky little strings and all stuff like that, and it's just kind of a pain in the butt because some of it won't come off. You got to take each every individual one off before you're finally done taking it out. That That's time-consuming. Well, cotton, is it's like that, but it's worse. A lot worse. And although cotton, there was a demand in England, as, the te as their textile industry starts growing, there becomes a demand for American cotton, but due to the factor that it takes so long to remove the cotton fibers from the seeds, the cost of producing it kind of outweighs the cost of the profit. So cotton is not really viewed as a profit crop. So with tobacco, rice, and indigo going out of style, and cotton just not really a very profitable crop at all, an economic crisis ensues, and slavery is brought into question. And slavery, honest to, honest to God, it was probably on its way out. It probably would have ended by the early 1800s if it weren't for 1793. And th that is the year that a wonderful New England school teacher by the name of Eli Whitney invents a new machine called the cotton gin. And you may have learned about this in your own history classes back in school. Now, what is the cotton gin? Well, it's a simple machine, but it does a very important task. And mind you, where we mentioned before, where cotton is kind of a hard thing because it takes so long to separate the seeds from the fiber, this machine can do this in not even probably less than half the time. It speeds the process up by a miraculous amount to the point that cotton is now profitable. And I, when I say profitable, I mean it is more profitable than tobacco ever was. So what do you think happens in the South? I'll tell you what happens. They go nuts for cotton, co tobacco, and indigo and rice are kind of phased out. And cotton becomes the new king crop or king cotton. It is like the most biggest cash crop the South has in its agricultural field. And of course... These cotton fields are large, and you need to pick the cotton first, so who are they going to get to pick those cotton balls? Slaves. And when I mean, they don't just keep the slaves they had, tobacco and indigo. It even increases the demand for the slaves because of how many cotton plantations start opening up due to the cotton gin's invention. And this, despite, skyrockets the slavery intake into the United States as well. To the point that it starts swelling enormously in the south, which is largely agricultural, while the north, it's dying out because the north is becoming more industrialized. It really doesn't have as large of an agricultural field, so they have no need for slaves. And in fact, between, ugh, do excuse me, between, um, let's see here, between 1774 and 1804, all of the northern states, with the exception of Delaware, abolished slavery within their borders. And many new northern states also did that, such as Ohio, Indiana. To give a couple, I live in Ohio. Well, in 1808, Congress, according to what the Constitution had provided back in 1787, it said that the slave trade could be abolished. Well, in 1808, it, starting in the year 1808 on January 1st. Well, Congress actually goes ahead and does this. They abolish the slave trade in 1808. But when I say abolish the slave trade, I mean they only abolish the import of any new slaves from Africa. There can no longer be slave ships coming to the country. 
Unfortunately, what Congress doesn't realize and what the government doesn't realize, this will not end slavery because cotton is rapidly still becoming the major cash crop. It's growing in its popularity. The plantations are enlarging themselves dramatically and there's still an ever increasing demand for slaves. So what happens? Although the importation of new slaves has stopped, the domestic trade is not. The trade of slaves in, from one state to another or at a slave auction. They would auction slaves off. Yes, really. They would sell them like at an auction. Like you go to an auction to buy a thing, well, they would do slaves just like that. And these auctions would happen in towns. They were slave. There were slave dealers. There would be people that had auctioneer of slaves or as they call them, the N-word. I'm not saying what that is. I think you can figure that out for yourself. I'm not going to list that word. I find it offensive to African Americans. Well, this domestic trade is not abolished. And the South is having has so many slaves by this point that they are able to encourage families to form within the for slaves to start having families in order to have new generations of slaves come. And then they start implementing strict codes to keep the slaves dependent on their masters, including the factor that their uh, status of whether or not they were a slave or free was mostly determined on the condition of the mother when they were born. And in most cases, the mother was a slave when they were born, thus their child is a slave as well. So this really... It might have banned the importation of new slaves from Africa, but it really doesn't end the slavery issue, and it only helps it get larger because now it's just going to fry within the country. It's gained such a population, it will survive on its own, being cut off from Africa, because there's so many that are in the country, they can survive off that. And over the next 50 years, due to this domestic trade, the slave population in the country doubles, actually triples, reaching 4 million by 1860. Now, enslaved people by 1860, they constituted one-third of the entire population in the South. Yes, the South had a large population if you look at anything from back then, but also keep in mind, one-third of that population is slaves. Only two-thirds of that is free white people. Now, many owners in government, as we said, they put codes, they put rules that, to ensure that the slaves were completely dependent on them, that they were restricted, they would never be able to really gain freedom. And on top of this, and I'm going to say this right now to those who don't think this is right, well, not, not to those who don't think this is right, who think slavery was no big issue, you tell me this this is right, and I'm going to read this off right here. Slave status, not slave status, we already went over that. Slaves were forbidden from reading, learning to read or write, and their movement was restricted. They would be chained. Oh, you think that's right, huh? Well, answer me this one. Many slave masters rewarded obedient slaves with favors. Take a hint of what those favors were. Extra food. Extra bedding. Minor little things. They weren't freedom. And here's the real catcher. Oh, slavery was okay. Oh, really? How would you like this? According to many accounts here, we had many slave masters taking sexual liberties with slave African American women, they went ahead and they were they would rape the slaves regardless and have children with them. Or sometimes the master would have them kill their own child. They abused these women. And the men too. But oh slavery was needed. It was an essential system. No, it was not. It was a sick system. It was a divisive system. It was a downright sinful system. And evil. I don't understand how human beings in their right mind could ever have thought this was right. This was natural. You want to know it is natural? Come over to my house. I'll, I'll give you a feeling what's natural. I'll bend you over. I'll bend you over my knee. If you think this was right, I will bend you over my knee. So don't come to my house if you're a racist. Don't ever. Don't come to near me anywhere. Don't ever. I just want to make that clear. I do apologize if I have a tone here to any of uh, anyone that may be watching this and is used to me being a little nice on this, but this issue kind of it ticks me off that racism is still in this country and we still can't get along. 
Because honestly, I view half this country as babies. Because people just don't know how to behave themselves. Not not all of this country is babies. There are good people out there. But there are a lot of them who unfortunately can't learn. And I fear for this country's future. I fear for the world's future. Because of it. Anyway. The one thing that really starts ter terrifying these owners of the slaves more than anything else is the possibility that slaves might rebel. They might try to uprise, might try to end the slavery system. This really actually makes them start to fear the slaves. And they had already built slave hierarchies, to, hierarchies within their plantations to try to discourage this. Now, what do I mean by slave hierarchies? I mean they would have some slaves more privileged than others, like field hands, field slaves, were less privileged than those who got to work in the big plantation manor or house. They were a lot less privileged. They were kept separate. They were given more privileges than those in the field and treated differently to try to discourage different groups of slaves from working together against their master, from rebelling. Now, not to say there were still slave rebellions regardless of this, and, this was, and the slave rebellions were another thing that kind of caused them not to want the slaves to read or write, they, because they deemed, well, if you can't read or write, you cannot really communicate with one another as effectively and really form a rebellion. Well, there were a few rebellions that did break out, such as the one by a slave named Gabriel Prosser in, in Richmond, Virginia in 1800, and one by Denmark Vesey in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822. However, most of these slave rebellions ended up in failure. They did not succeed, and in most cases, the participant slaves were usually executed after it was done. Now, the most significant slave rebellion occurred in 1831 in Virginia, and this was commonly known as Nat Turner's Rebellion after its leader, who was a slave named Nat Turner. Nat Turner was a former slave in Virginia. He ended up actually killing his master, if I'm not wrong, because he went on rebellion here. And it was in Southampton County, Virginia. And he, and a, eventually, he had about 75 blacks, former, 75 slaves with him that joined with him. And they went on a rampage through Southampton County, Virginia. And they killed over 60 white plantation owners. And th they basically continued to kill this many. They killed 60 before finally being overwhelmed by both the locals and the state militia. Following their capture, Nat Turner was not even really tried. He was just executed. He was hung. But it also made the, the slave states really start to fear further slave rebellions that they really started tightening their codes to try to prevent the slaves from uprising again. Now, I feel this is also a good time to show some new images here, so let me show you some images. And also, when I, may I also list, if a slave was found, um, let's, let's discuss this before I show some images here. Slaves, if they were found trying to run away, if they were found disobeying their master, they could be pounded to the ground for the simplest thing. They were whipped. And I, when I say whipped, I mean they were whipped until they bled. Oh, that's humane. You wouldn't do that to a dog. Why would you do it to a human being? Answer me that. Oh, don't do that to a little doggy. Or back, I, I'm speaking in terms of back then. Oh, don't do that to a little doggy. Don't, don't whip him. Oh, go ahead and whip the slave. He didn't listen. That is messed up. Okay, don't whip the dog, but yeah, whip the human being. Oh, no, they're a slave. No, they're a human being. They're not property. They are human beings. They're people just like you. How would you like me to take that whip and whip you, overseer? Huh? How about you take your shirt off there? I'll do it for you. Or better yet, let me see your head. I'll whip the overseer. But anyway, and then other times, to really, they would chain slaves up after they'd run away. They would brand them. They would beat them. They would just taunt them everywhere. And then sometimes they would also, uh, I think another thing that they would do was if a slave had run away once and they'd recaptured the slave, not only would he be beat when he come back by the master usually, but usually they would put a collar around the slave's neck. And this collar would kind of protrude up and have bells. Well, you'd think, well, that's just goofy. Why would you do that? Well, 
here's what it does. If that slave tries to run away again, he can't do so quietly. Because when he's running, the bells are going to jingle. And when the when they're late at night and they start hearing the bells jingle like Santa Claus is on the roof, they're like, oh, slave's making a run for it. Send the dogs. It kind of alerts the owner that he's making another run for it. He or she is making another run for, for it. So it's kind of cruel that not only are they beating these slaves and everything else, but they're even sent, they're even going right after them when they run away. They would send bounty hunters. Yes, not not Star Wars bounty hunters, but bounty hunters that they would be offered a large amount of money just to find the slave and return him safely to the master. I want to show you some images here as we're going through. So let's really cover this here. Just so of some plantation life on plantations in the south and i'd like to also show you a uh, unfortunate picture of a slave after he got of the scars on his back after he had been whipped and this was a slave in louisiana and then we're also gonna kind of go over here a minute and i'm gonna show you a thing on the states actually i might not need to Actually, yes, I will. I will. Yeah, I will. Okay. I want to show the plantation workers first. So this was life on a plantation here for a slave. They would have to work in the hot baking sun every day, have to pick the cotton. This is a cotton field. This is a cotton field. The slaves would have to go in there every day picking cotton without pay. You're not getting paid for this. Now, you would get quarters... To sleep in and eat with your family, but it's still a hard life. You're expected to work constantly from dawn till dusk. And I'm not just meaning the women and men. They would make the children work like this, too. And you're like, look at this slave. Having to carry this big old basket of cotton on their back. Can you imagine doing that? And it's 90-some degrees every day. Can you imagine doing that? I sure they. Can't. I do apologize for the brief outburst there, but it's true. Why would you do that to a human being? If I'm getting paid for it, okay, but not against my will, I'm not. Here's a big uh, image of some slaves on a plantation that was liberated during the Civil War, actually. But this kind of shows how many slaves were on this plantation alone in some of their quarters. Look how many. Oh, that, oh, that's natural. That, that's okay. That ain't okay. That's wrong. It's messed up. And then when I mentioned, um, oh, here, before we do that, here, here's a picture of a slave overseer on his horse in the middle of the cotton field just kind of watching the slaves and making sure they aren't doing nothing funny. This is the type of guy that if they start doing something, he'll whip them. You see the slaves working in the cotton field here. Here's one. I think there's one here. Here. And right here on the horse, here's the slave overseer just watching them. Waiting to see if he has to whip them or something like that. This is this is evil. Evil. To all you racists, what in God's name makes you think that this was right? What in the Lord's name makes you think that not only was that right, but that black people are inferior. There is nothing that says they are inferior. They are equal to us in every way there is possible. They're human beings, for crying out loud. We have the same creator. And that is the Lord up in heaven. I don't know why people can't understand that. You think that racism is okay? Well, guess what? You go ahead and you think racism is okay. Because you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to go down there and meet the little pitchfork devil. You think racism is okay? Okay, you go down there and you meet him. Tell me how it goes. Oh, wait. I won't be able to hear from you. As I mentioned the slave auction houses earlier, I'd show a picture here. Here was an actual auction house in Atlanta, Georgia, where I mentioned they would have auction houses for slaves. Wherever right here is what they'd advertise out front. I'm not saying that word. I'm not saying that word. 
they would have that out in front. And some places they're preserved. I think there's a preserved one that's a museum down in Charleston, South Carolina. Here is an image. When they would auction the slaves off, they would they would kind of bring each slave up one by one on kind of a stand of made of stone or made of wood to try to show off the slave to the bidders, to the buyers. And right here is a surviving slave um, auction block, so to speak. It's made of stone, but they would stand the slave up, make him stand up on top of this, and he they would kind of show the slave off, be it a child, be it a man, be it a woman. And they would auction them off. And may I mention that when they auctioned these slaves off, they didn't care if they auctioned off members of the family. A nine-year-old child could be separated from their parents for life. A father from his family. A mother from hers. And only mother and her daughter could be separated for life. They didn't care. Now, if they were merciful, some slave masters would buy the whole family or buy the mother and daughter together or something like that, or the father and son. But most of them weren't. How would you like to be torn apart from your family? How would you like that? Not too well, I imagine. Not too well. So think about that. I want a list here of... Here was where slavery had ex really extended by the South. You can see the densest areas where slaves were in the southern states that had slavery by 1860. The dark, dark areas are where the most slaves are at. And this is by counties in the southern states. And you can see there's a lot right down here in the Mississippi River Valley, especially in Louisiana and Mississippi. And you can also see there's a lot here over here about where, where South Carolina is. And Virginia, Virginia up here, there's a lot. The darker areas are the heaviest concentrated areas of populations of slaves up to 1860. Just a, it's just a shame. It's a shame. It makes me sick. Now, I also want to show this picture. I mind you, I don't know if too many people might get offended, not offended, but they might get a little grossed out by this, but I feel it needs to be shown as the greatest possible thing I can do to try to refute those who may think racism was right, that slavery or all this was right. Let me let me show you something here. You're telling me that if I went up to a man and he had this on his back, you're telling me that's humane and okay? If I saw if I saw a man come up to me and show me his back like that, I'd probably be calling nine one one and asking what happened to him. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be okay with that. I would be scared out of my life and concerned for the guy. This is the back of a slave that had been whipped multiple times by his master down in Louisiana. These are the scars on his back that the whip left when it made wounds on his back. These are the scars. You think this is okay? You think this is okay? Look at that. Makes me sick. It makes me appalled. Slavery was not good. It was not a natural institution. It was a man-made institution made by, made by a bunch of degenerates. That couldn't understand the basic values of equality and freedom in this nation. If you believe that was right, get out of here. Now. Now, as I mentioned, after Nat Turner's execution occurred, many of the... Uh, not only were many of the slave states' slave codes really... Um, kind of uh, strengthened, but a lot of them also, a lot of pro-slavery people tried to use it as justification for slavery. They tried to say that, well, they're rebelling and they're killing white settlers. Well, it just proves they're, they're barbarians. They need slavery. It's required to discipline them. How about I discipline you for even thinking that? Why don't I discipline you while I'm at it? Hmm? This, that was a wrong statement. It was a false statement that they tried to... It was an excuse to try to continue slavery. 
Now, due to widespread fear, that continued. Now, abolitionist movement. Abolition movements really start, fri they thrive in the free states that are in the north of the country, and north of the Ohio River primarily. And they rapidly gained influence in the years between 1830 and the end of the Civil War in 1865. Some were white, some of the leaders were whites, that, such as William Lloyd Garrison, who had his own kind of anti slavery about abolitionist newspaper. The Liberator, I believe its name was, and Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote the anti-slavery novel Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1854, I believe. I could be a little wrong on the year, but it really, it was about a slave called Uncle Tom, who unfortunately was constantly being beaten and oppressed by Simon Legree, a vicious slave overseer. And if you've ever read the novel, I've not personally read it, but I've seen little snippets of it. It's, it, Although it was a fictional story, it really vilified and really brought home to many people the horrors of slavery, of what was really going on, of how brutal this institution was. Now, other leaders of the abolitionist movement were actually free blacks, former slaves themselves such as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And in case you don't know who Harriet Tubman is, we've got a photo of her somewhere. Where do I get a photo of her at? Ah, I see it. This is Harriet Tubman. She was an abolitionist leader and a conductor on the Underground Railroad, which we'll discuss here very shortly. Now, many argued of the abolitionists that slavery was either a sin or it was no longer any, made any economic sense to even keep in the country. So they're starting to argue, we don't need it here. It's wrong. Well, many abolitionists, they helped enslave sca slaves escape from the South. They tried to help them in any way that they could through a series of escape little networks of Safe houses, a network of safe houses of abolitionist leaders and sympathizers who were willing to take slaves into hiding places in their own homes, and then during the night they would get them out of there and help them and get them to the next house that was further up the north on this network chain. There were thousands of network chains in order to get them to across the Ohio River up to the northern free states where they could be free, or if they could, up to Canada which Canada had outlawed slavery. If they got to Canada, they were out of the United States jurisdiction and they could they were permanently free and the slave catchers couldn't go to Canada to get them. So the main goal was mostly get them to Canada. And this network of safe houses really becomes known as the Underground Railroad. It was not a railroad at all, but a series of safe houses that often the hiding spaces they would have for slaves were usually in the basement or something like that. And actually, where I live here in Ohio, we have a small town nearby that was actually a stop on this railroad. I do not want to say what town that is, only due to the factor I don't want anyone knowing exactly where I live. But anyway, the Underground Railroad really freed a lot of slaves over the years. It helped free some. It wasn't all. It wasn't ex exceedingly massive, but it was still impressive. They made an effort to try to help. And it is estimated between anywhere between forty to 100,000 actually gained freedom in this way. A lot of slaves were freed this way. And conductors like Harriet Tubman were people who would lead these slaves to the next safe house. They would lead them there. This is a map here. I don't know how we can be able to see this. Of the many routes that the Underground Railroad had. All these little small lines, like especially right here in my home state of Ohio... These small little crisscross lines going across and up, these all lead to Canada eventually, right? Here's another one. There's all kinds of small ones in here. I'll let you get a close-up look that way you can decide it for yourself. And you can pause the video if you want to and really look. But they mostly go up here to Canada where they can be free up to the south. So a lot of these slave states were getting... Abol abolitionists going down and trying to help the free the slaves. And a lot of the slave states then got angered because they started seeing that their northern countrymen are trying to basically go against their what they deem as their survival institution that's helping them thrive. 
Now, Congress did try to intervene sometimes on the slavery issue, most famously in the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which I covered earlier a couple months a couple months ago. And I will and I will put a little thing for this that video if you wish to watch it at the end of this video. And, and it, they but compromise basically it. Keep in mind, some slaves, some states were allowing slavery and others were not. Thus, they were called either a slave state or a free state. And the question came, was Missouri wanted to be admitted as a slave state, but it was above the typical slave line. Well, they made a compromise in which they would admit Missouri as a slave state, but they would also admit the territory of Maine as a free state, and they would bar slavery, any new slave state being formed, north of Missouri's southern border. The only state that would be an exception to that would be Missouri. There would be no further states created north of that border, but Missouri would be. Now, this largely kind of kept the issue a little bit quiet over the years. With the addition of many, many cases, there would be a slave state and a free state admitted within simultaneous of each other. Such as after the Missouri Compromise in 1836, you had the slave state of Arkansas be admitted. And then the following year, in 1837, you had the free state of Michigan be admitted. Well, this really continued until after the Mexican-American War ended, which I also did a video on, in 1848. Now, this ends, and Mexico grants a huge amount of land to the United States in what is known as the Mexican Cession, which compromises most of Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, it compromise a lot of those lands and most of t what is rest well the rest of Texas. Well, the question is again the expansion of slavery into these new lands because not all of this land is below that southern Missouri borderline. Some of it is north. And in fact, when California wanted to be admitted as a, as a state in 1850 and applied for statehood, there was a debate over whether to admit California entirely as a free state or whether to split it, the south off from it and admit it as so North and South California due to the so southern part of it uh, kind of falling below that line and allowing slavery. Now, the Compromise of 1850 was thus made, and this allowed California to be admitted as a free state, but in return... It created many new laws, in the most, including the Fugitive Slave Law, which would allow northern state governments and their law authorities to cooperate with the federal authorities or bounty hunt slave catchers that were coming up from the south chasing after these runaway slaves. And that if you were caught helping a runaway slave, you could be penalized with a fine. And basically it was trying to come to the needs of both the north and the south. The south wanted the, an end to the fugitive slave kind of runaways that were going on with the Underground Railroad, and the North wanted another free state. Well, unfortunately, neither side was really satisfied with this. The, the South felt it didn't do enough, and the North was kind of outraged that now the slave catchers could go on their own soil and try to catch these slaves. And it actually got worse in 1854, four years later, with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And this was passed during the administration of President Franklin Pierce, the 14th president. And this act, basically, it opened up all the new territories to slavery by allowing voters in the territories to decide whether to have slavery or not. Basically, by popular sovereignty, people in the territories could now vote of, over whether or not to allow slavery. It was no longer predetermined by whether or not you were north of that southern Missouri border. This sparks conflict immediately, especially in Kansas, which is a territory at the time, and and what is known as Bleeding Kansas, you had many, many fights and skirmishes break out in Kansas as settlers rush into the territory to try to influence the voting. There are many abolitionists coming into the territory of Kansas, and then there are a bunch of pro-slavery settlers coming in from the neighboring state of Missouri, which allows slavery. And you have these pro-slavery and abolitionist groups, they're literally fighting each other. They're going out with guns. They're shooting each other and killing each other in Kansas constantly due to this to try to influence over whether or not the slave would be a free or s slave. Eventually, Kansas is admitted as a free state just before the Civil War begins. 
1857, it gets even worse. The Supreme Court, in the Dred Scott case, which was done basically by a case, with a case of a slave called named Dred Scott, who sued his former master over the factor that he had taken him while he was a slave, he had gone and lived in the free state of Illinois for a t short amount of time. Well, I think it was Illinois or Iowa, one of the two. But anyway, Scott argued that because his master had gone and lived in a free state for a short amount of time with his slave, that he was legally free because he had taken him to a free territory. He was no longer in a slave state. And the Supreme Court, in one of its most controversial decisions, decided that Scott was not free. He was a slave, and not only that he was a slave, but it, all slaves were not people. They said slaves were property and not people. Thus, Scott could not be free by, by his master simply moving to a free state because he wasn't a person. The Supreme Court of the United States saying an African American is not a person. Is property. That is a shame. And then they basically this declares that slaves were property and they had absolutely no rights. And it kind of overturns the entire Missouri Compromise since because now if slaves are property and if the Supreme Court's saying that, well, you can't really be freed anyway because it's property and the Constitution says you can't take away property without a warrant. Well, the Southerners thought, well, this solves the issue. Because right there, the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. They've basically said that it's their property. You can't take them away from us. It's our property. They're not people. Well, it doesn't solve the issue. It intensifies it further because now the North is enraged over this decision. And they refuse to accept it. And the tensions grew higher still. In 1859, just two years later, when abolitionist John Brown and a group of 22 men seized control of a federal armory in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, which today is now in West Virginia, and they order in order to try to arm a slave rebellion. They want to arm slaves with guns and lead a slave rebellion. Now, Brown is surrounded in the armory. He eventually surrenders and is executed, but it also kind of creates further distrust between the North and South because that in the North, Brown is kind of seen as a martyr. He's seen as a hero to the abolitionist movement, while in the South, he's seen as a vile murderer who went to oppose and destroy and murder whites. Now, also at the same time, a new political party begins to form, and that is the Republican Party, which kind of shocks me that our current president is a Republican, but yet he's sitting here and doing nothing. Yes, shocks me. And the new Republican Party was created basically by anti-slavery anti advocates during the 1850s. And in, 18, in the presidential election of 1860, the Republicans nominate the lawyer from Illinois and former representative for Il House representative for Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, who we all know who he is. And Lincoln wins election in 1860. Now, Lincoln had campaigned on a promise of that he was going to oppose the extension of slavery into new territories, but he was willing to let it continue where it already existed. The southern states, in their wonderful glory, saw and tried to warp this vision. And even today, if there, if you see a neo-Confederate out there, one of those kind of big, deep South lost cause people who are so d demented it ain't funny, they basically tried to say that, oh no, Lincoln was gonna, he was gonna get rid of slavery outright. They were defending their institution. They were defending the state's rights to oppose the federal government. Well, yes, they were defending states' rights, but here's where you try to kind of cut it out. It was the state's rights over whether or not they could continue to allow slavery on their own authority or whether or not they had to follow the federal government, which I'm sorry to say they had to follow the federal government. You can try to disguise that all you want, but the Civil War was about slavery. One way or another, it comes to that. Yes, states' rights was there, but you bypass a lot of crap to make it seem like it was just that. It wasn't, and it wasn't the main cause. Now, many at first didn't realize slavery as the main cause at first, but eventually they did. Now, following Lincoln's election, the seven, seven southern states secede from the Union. They leave. They withdraw from the Union because they think that Lincoln is going to end slavery everywhere, even though he's even said that he's not going to do that. They don't listen. 
and they secede from the Union to form the Confederate States of America, which I think we all know what that is. And with and four more states secede from the Union following the Civil War starting on, in April of 1861 after the Confederate forces fire on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. Uh, the states in the United States have seceded. I will list you which ones have seceded here, and then we're going to kind of go over to the uh, fridge here. The states that were seceded, and this is in order, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, and then after Fort Sumter, we have Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. All these states secede from the Union because they think Lincoln's going to abolish slavery, and they claim it's states' rights. No, it's overprotecting slavery. And if you don't want to believe that, well, look at the Confederate Constitution, because the Confederate Constitution is basically just like the United States Constitution, except for one difference. There is a clause in there that explicitly protects the institution of slavery. Oh, this isn't it about slavery. Well, it isn't. Well, why would you put something in there that protects it? Hmm? What else am I going to take that as? But anyway, that's that. Now, before we continue, I would like to show everyone here a little map of what, just in case you want to see a map here of the states that seceded. I'm going to try this. I never really moved it before as we go. I don't know how well this is going to show up either. You know, I need to rearrange some things here short. No, actually, I'm going to keep them. Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, we're going to talk about this little one here in a second, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. Now, at the time, consider West Virginia to be part of Virginia, because at the time it actually was. This was part of Virginia. Now, the Civil War opens up. All of the states, of the southern states here that allowed slavery, most of them secede, except for Missouri. They're called what we call border states, slave states that actually stayed in the Union. Kentucky. And Maryland would technically be part of this as well, but I can really stuff on this. But and then the Northwestern powers in Virginia, which are not really slave owning powers, they don't have a lot of slave power in their powers, they actually choose to secede from their own state when it secedes from the Union. And they are admitted in eighteen sixty three as the state of West Virginia. So this is really here. This is what we're looking at. Is our state that allows slavery and is still in the union? Well, Maryland and Missouri actually have the government have to stop them from having secession convention. Kentucky declared neutrality, but it took the union side after the Confederates invaded. Now, these states. This is the Confederacy. These are the states that actually broke away trying to form a new country. Guess what? They failed. And had they kind of stayed here, I want to add, Oklahoma would have been a slave state, New Mexico and Arizona, and this southern part of California probably would have been. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that into attention for a second here. <sighs> we're almost done with all this, but hey, we're making it long, means we're doing our job. So, with the Civil War has broken out now, now Lincoln... As I mentioned, Lincoln only said he wanted to abolish slavery from entering new territories. He did not want to abolish it where or wherever it was. And Lincoln even stated during the Civil War that if he could free some of the if he could restore the Union by freeing some of the slaves, he would do it. If he could restore the Union by freeing all of them, he would do it. And if he could restore the Union by not having to free any of them, he would do it. Unfortunately, the southern states in their arrogant state of mind and racist state of mind wouldn't accept that, wouldn't accept the common compromise of the Union's willing to work with you on this, but you're not. And you're defending a vile institution that is evil to its core. 
And eventually, it kind of dominates the Civil War. Now, the abolition of slavery was not what the war started out as. It was more to restore the Union. Abraham Lincoln did not view the southern states had any right to break away from the United States. So initially, it was about preserving the Union. But as the war went on, it became a military necessity, and it became very clear that he would probably have to free the slaves. But due to both – he the, the North kind of realized the slaves formed a large part of the South's economy. If you free the slaves, that cripples the South's economy. They can't run a war. And it also – abolitionist sentiment is rapidly increasing in the North. Especially now that the southern states are no longer there to oppose them. And as the Union armies go south, there are many slaves are self-emaciating, emancipating themselves. They're freeing themselves as the Union armies come south and evade and take over the plantations and stuff like that and kind of run through. So Lincoln finally actually ends up doing this. And following the Battle of Antietam in Maryland in September 1862, in which a Union victory kind of did come out. Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, and this would take effect on January 1st, 1863, and declared that all slaves in any state or area of rebellion were free. Now, I want to make this clear. Many get this wrong. The Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery entirely. It only ended slavery in areas still controlled by the Confederacy. This did not count the border states of Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Maryland, and it did not count the Confederate areas, the areas of the Confederacy that were already under Union occupation, such as most of Tennessee at that point, so in or New Orleans and parts of Louisiana and Arkansas that were all, so basically the border, the slaves in the border states and areas of the Confederacy that are already occupied by the Union, those slaves are still not free. But the slaves that are still in parts of the, the, but the slaves that are in the actual parts of the Confederacy that are still parts of the Confederacy, they're still in rebellion. They are free. Now, although this did not free all the slaves, it still did a substantial job because it freed free three million of these slaves. It crippled the South's economy, and it turned international opinion to the North side. The Confederacy realized early on that they needed to get international recognition, and they most importantly tried with Britain and France. But due to the slavery issue, they were both kind of hesitant to do so, and when Lincoln decided he was going to free them all, it really sol solidified his support from Britain and France and the others, and no nation was really going to side with the South at all. So basically, that's that. Now, as for the end of slavery, that comes in December of 1865, after the war was over, and unfortunately, President Lincoln was shot in April of that year due to a white supremacist Confederate sympathizer named John Wilkes Booth, who we discussed in another video. And in December 1865, the Congress passes the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which abolishes slavery once and for all within, within any territory within the United States. Slavery or bondage is no longer legally allowed. Slavery is done. And just, I want to add this here before we really get off the subject, is during the Civil War, 186,000 black soldiers served in the Union Army. They were fighting for their freedom. And 38,000 of them were actually killed. And actually, I want to add this too. When these black soldiers would go south and they would fight for the north, where white soldiers would, might be given a prisoner of war, if you had a. Usually they, were, had, they had white commanders, of course. Well, if you sent a black regiment against a Confederate ford or a Confederate line, they would kill without mercy. They wouldn't take prisoners. And if you were caught, if you were a white commander, and you were caught commanding them, they would, ooh, they would, they, ooh, I'm not even going to say what they would do to you. The Confederates viewed it as the utmost offense to see an African-American soldier with a gun. They viewed it as the utmost offense. So I want to just conclude that here. Now, that is the history of slavery in this country, and that concludes here our first video on this topic. And I hope to goodness gracious, I tried to do something to try to denounce racism in this a little bit.
and really bring forth some of the horrors and just the evil that was done. It wasn't right. And, of course, that ends this. Now, I will have a second video here coming before too long. Hopefully, maybe this weekend, but it could be early next week. And that will be covering Re Reconstruction, which is immediately after the Civil War, which largely deals with giving blacks their rights. And... Jim Crow laws, which is basically segregation and Jim Crow laws, basically. So we're going to cover basically between 1865, the end of the Civil War, until roughly the 1950s. So we'll count the up to the 1940s, 1865 to the 1940s. So we're going to cover that time period here, when segregation, where they give they give the rights and citizenship to the blacks, but then they don't force it. Terrorist, racist organizations kind of come up like certain white hooded people that we really I don't want to even say right now and the government kind of slacks the blacks aren't given the rights that they're rightfully supposed to be given and it takes almost another hundred years before our movement starts again to really pound the government and say hey wake up get your butt moving do something which today that's why we're having to protest because the government unless you really get on their butt they don't do nothing be a Democrat, be it Republican, be it Libertarian, be whatever political party you want to say of. None of them have the guts to do anything right anymore. And I don't know why. We need a good, honest president. We need a good, honest politicians in that Senate, in the House of Representatives. We need them everywhere. I don't know what is so wrong with this world that we cannot understand that. So anyway... That is the conclusion to this video. I will have the second video up by either next week or maybe this weekend if I'm lucky. So I will have that up in due time. And do continue to stay with us through this crisis here as this kind of goes on. And support those who are standing out against this injustice because they really they need support. We need to show this the government that we are no longer going to stand for this anymore. It's reached a point that it needs to be addressed once and for all. So this is all for this video. Again, like and subscribe to the channel and just be sure to come back and listen to the further videos that we will have on this subject. Of course, list any comments that you may have in the comment section below of any sort. So have, hopefully everyone else has a rest of their good evening and we will see you with the next video when that comes out.